Hey guys, welcome into the Stinky Truth Podcast for uh, Mike Evans. I am Mark Schler. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for watching and uh, subscribing. We really appreciate you guys still growing like a weed. So that is all on you guys. We appreciate that. Mike, how are you, buddy? Oh, I'm great. Just another weekend full of great storylines from the NFL. I want to jump right into it because I know you're based there in New York City now. So I'm fascinated to hear what you've picked up on. It was 10 days ago. Everybody was like, wow, Aaron Rodgers looks great. Look at the way he's moving. The arm looks fresh. All it took was one performance against the Broncos in the rain to have everybody say, wow, he looked old. He looks old. Yeah. He can yeah. barely move. Right, he did. I mean, it was like the weather. You know how you, well, old people say, oh, it's about ready to rain. Like, my knee <laughs> acted up. Like, that's Aaron Rodgers right now. Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting because there certainly seems to be a bit of a riff in between Aaron Rodgers and and the head coach of the New York Jets, Robert Sala. It, 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 there's not there's not a harmony in that relationship. And if you remember, right after the game, because they had five false starts, they gave up five sacks, and Robert Sala mentioned that that cadence might have been an issue, and we might need to revamp or re you know discuss the cadence issues. And Aaron Rodgers came out and somebody asked him about it after the game. And he said, well, that that's one solution, I guess. I've been doing it this way my whole career. And uh, we've been doing it all training camp and OTAs and everything else. We had one false start in the first three games. And now all of a sudden it's an issue. So, you know, Aaron called. Uh, this is what I'm imagining happened. I think that Aaron probably called Robert Sala into his office, uh, into Aaron's office, and gave him a stern lecture on uh, who's actually running the team. And uh, so Robert Sala came out yesterday and completely backpedaled and essentially apologized and said there was no issue with the operation of Cadence. Um, you know, and Cadence is, it, it, it's actually, it, like the one time they got down to the one yard line, they got that pass interference call. Um, they did that, on, they, they got that on Cadence, by the way. So that was one of those shots they took on a cadence where they got, they drew, I think the Broncos offsides, and then they got the PI call when he threw it down the football field. So, like, the the one time you actually got close to scoring was because you used your cadence effectively. And ultimately, as an offensive player, cadence is a weapon. When used properly, it is an absolute weapon. And I always look at it from my perspective as an offensive lineman. We are collectively the worst athletes on the field. And so really the only weapon we have is using cadence to keep you off balance. It's again, a way to take the passive kind of out of the way you play. I always talk about taking the passive out of pass protection. When you use cadence effectively, man, you can quick count somebody, you can long count somebody, you can get them off balance so they're not just teeing off on you and that levels the playing field. My advantage is I know when we're going, you don't. And if we use it effectively and you can't get a beat on when we're, when we're taking off, then guess what? That's an advantage for us as an offense. And like there, there certainly does not seem like this is a, this is, there's a harmonious relationship. It, it seems like there's stress and tension right now between Aaron Rodgers and head coach Robert Sala. But it would seem like we, we know that Rodgers has been able to use this so effectively over the years as a weapon in Green Bay. So it would seem to me that it is up to the rest of the Jets players, Robert Sala, to kind of catch up with Aaron rather yeah. than Aaron having to acquiesce to them. Right. And I think, I, I think you're hundred percent right. It's like, he's going to use it. So you guys better be on, yeah. on point. The other thing was, and we're not giving credit at all to Vance Joseph and the Denver Broncos defense. They dominated in that game. I mean, they had a sack on the very first play of the game and they attacked protections they knew exactly what the Jets were in. They attacked the protections to get the one-on-one -on -one matchups that they wanted. And, like, they came with zero blitz. They came with pressures. They came with lock-up linebackers. They got them to sit on one thing, and they attacked from a, a different edge. They knew when the turn was coming and how to attack opposite the turn. Like, they did everything 
so so incredibly well that they just dismantled the Jets as an offense. And, you know, let's face it, the Jets have some injuries that they've had to overcome on the offensive side of the ball. They did not look good in that game, but I'm giving a lot of credit to Vance Joseph and that defense for really understanding those protections, how to attack those protections, and winning in those protections. So um, that was that was an incredible game plan by him, and uh, they dismantled the Jets, dismantled Aaron Rodgers, and ultimately, you know, won that game defensively, only allowing nine points. Jumping around here, I, I know they've they've been able to you know, win a couple, but does something just still, and did we see another example of it on Sunday against Tampa? Just, just something feels off about Philadelphia. Doesn't, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, it's, they've got the same issue going on with their head coach and their quarterback. Like it doesn't feel right. It feels like there's tension there that there's not, um, you know, a full level of respect there. So yeah, there is something that's certainly off And, you know, we talk about talent. I know A.J. Brown missed the game. And I know that, you know, uh, Devontae Smith is coming back from a a, a concussion. Uh, Also, the outstanding right tackle, Lane Johnson, missed the game. So there are some issues there. With that said, they're still a really talented football team. And defensively, the the biggest issue to me was not so much offensively. I mean, they had a bunch of three and outs to start the game, which is never good. But defensively, you know, you went out and got Vic Fangio, right? The the, the you know, creator of all things defense. And all Tampa did was get rid of the ball in under one second, and they swung everything out to the edges. So they stayed away from the middle of the football field where they have, you know, really big physical guys. They got to the edge, attacked C gaps in the run game. And then all they did was throw swing passes, bubble screen, swing pass, slant, swing pass, bubble screen. Swing. It was all out of Baker Mayfield's hand within about a second. And I'm like, at some point, I, I'm watching the game, Mike, and I'm going, at some point, don't you walk up and start pressing? If you're just going to hit slant after slant and swing pass after swing pass, shouldn't you walk up on the line of scrimmage at some point, cloud a corner, and if you're going to throw another swing pass, I'm going to run up there, but that guy's about to catch it, I'm going to hit him in the teeth four yards in the backfield, and I'm going to put a stop to that? Like, I, I don't understand – why there was never an adjustment. There never seemed to like, hey, I want to press you. On, on like, what well, Cloud Corner is a guy that sits on the line of scrimmage, right? He's in that, he's in the flat. So you jam, 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 stop at about six yards and just sit there, seven, eight yards, right? So why not jam, 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 don't let the guy off on a slant and then sit there if you hit the swing pass, run up there and hit the shit out of the guy. Like, I don't understand. Like, there was no adjustment at all. They just let Tampa go bleep, 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 right down the football field time and time again to the point where the game was out of hand in the first quarter. Like, I I, I did not understand how, how you don't make one adjustment. Like, I, I didn't understand that at all, Mike. So, yeah, they've got torn apart. And so defensively, they're not adjusting. Offensively, they're out of sync. And that quarterback has turned the ball over. Jalen Hurts has turned the ball over in the last – I think he has 27 turnovers in the last 21 games or something like that. I mean, something ridiculous. At some point, you know, as a head coach, you're either coaching or allowing it to happen. Like, what is your job? I mean, you've got an offensive coordinator that you turned over the, the play calling to. you got a defensive coordinator that you turned over the defense to. And yet you still make horrible decisions on fourth down every game, it seems like. And at some point, you call up to the, the defensive coordinator and go, hey, listen, they're killing us on the edges of our defense. I don't know, maybe um, maybe uh, do something about it <laughs> differently than you've done for the last eight quarter. You know, I, I don't like, – at some point, don't you have to do something? Are you, are you like – I would just like to see him with a hot dog, you know, Nick Sirianni on the side, like maybe a hot dog, maybe some popcorn, just enjoying the game. Oh, come on. This popcorn's delicious, man. Somebody give me another dog, you know? I need a soda. My throat's a little dry. Like, I, what, what do you do here? It's like office space. What is it that you would say that you do here? I'm a people person. I'm a people person. I, I pass it from the customers down to the IT. You know, I, I don't know what he does. Uh, you know, it's funny because Tampa played a, a great game. Baker Mayfield played a great game. And yet all anybody's talking about is how Baker kind of um, stepped on Superman's cape when he was quoted in a podcast talking about Tom Brady's time with the Bucks, saying that guys weren't having fun. And 
Tom Brady working the broadcast laid into Baker saying, oh, I'm sorry, is is winning Super Bowls fun? Is 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 that not fun? I mean, are we running a daycare here or are we trying right. to win Super Bowls? I thought it, 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 it shined a light on certainly Tom Brady's view of what it takes to win big. Did he go too far or did maybe Baker Mayfield – maybe learn a lesson that, yeah, you know, it, it takes a different mentality when you're trying to win Super Bowls. Yeah, you know, sometimes you get on a podcast, it gets a little loosey-goosey. You don't feel no, like really? Yeah, really? Yeah, I, really? I, 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 I really? In a little <laughs> bit of trouble every now and again with, uh, you know, being on the podcast. But, yeah, I mean, that, that stuff happens. Um and, and, you know, in regards to Brady, like it made, you know, a, a viral moment. I kept seeing that in the Tom Brady's viral moment. Um, yeah, like like you're, you're there to win ultimately, but at the same time, it's got to be fun. You got to be having a good time, right? It's, right. It, it is still, you're still playing a kid's game. Um, you know, maybe much ado about nothing. Um, but, but yeah, Brady is like, hey, man, if I want to have fun, I'll take my kids to Disney World. Like, all right. Like there was part of me that was like, okay, calm down, right? Like you're not, <laughs> you, you never dicked around in the in the training room or in the you know the locker room. You never played a game of darts or something. You know, was it all just grind, 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 grind? Um, and every guy I talked to in Tampa at the time did say, by the way, because I did a couple of Brady games in Tampa. They did say, by the way, oh yeah, like uh, I thought I was you know prepared and I thought I was working hard and I thought I was you know, studying. And I thought like, and then Brady came along. You're like, Oh shoot. Got to pick up my game. So there's a, a level of truth to that, but there has to be a mixture between the work and, you know, the seriousness of the game and also occasionally having a good time and, and goofing around with your guys. So, um, yeah, it did, you know, it did tend to be, uh, it, it, it did, it did catch a lot of eyeballs and a lot of ears. No question about it. So last week when we were doing this podcast and we were talking about the game you were going to call last week, Washington at Arizona, I said, hey, Mark, are, are you prepared to say that Washington is back? And you said, no, 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 no. I'm not ready to go there yet. They still got a lot of a lot of boxes to check. Um did they go a long way towards changing your opinion this past Sunday? Yeah, I still think, Mike, I still think defensively they've they've got, you know, a talent issue on the defensive side of the ball. Um, and they're going to give up some big plays and they're going to, you know, they're they're got to win shootouts, you know. And talking to Dan Quinn, their head coach, um, it was like he's done a really good job. You know, I just talked about Nick Sirianni. What do you do here? Like Dan Quinn doesn't call the defensive plays. He, 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 he turned that over to Witt, his defensive coordinator. Um, but I, I will tell you, I think it's Witt. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Anyhow, uh, regardless, he was with him in Dallas. So, um, but, but Dan is like a big believer in what do we have to do to win this football game? And if you look back to Cincinnati, they had a fourth down and three. They went for it where, you know, they, they are fourth down two or three, where they converted that fourth down to Luke McCaffrey for about 20, 30 yards. They had a fourth and nine. Zach Ertz caught the ball on a fourth and nine. They had a fourth and two or three, where I think Jaden Daniels converted with his feet. So, like, he knew that that was going to be a shootout, and he knew his defense wasn't going to stop Cincinnati. So he's like, I've got to make sure that I take advantage of every offensive possession, and we've got to end in scores. Um, so they're going to play a super aggressive style that way based upon the way they're constructed, the way they're built, and based upon the fact that defensively they lack, you know, they lack some some players. But I'm going to tell you offensively, um, I was so impressed talking to Cliff Kingsbury. And you love it when a guy can look at, you know, what he's done in the past and say, didn't work, and I've got to get better. And so Cliff Kingsbury brings this air raid offense to the NFL. And, you know, his whole experience has been four wide receivers, spread offense, and we're going to dink and dunk and, you know, do all these things. And realizing that, man, it's not college football. This is not working in the NFL. And getting away from it for a year, you know, going to uh, – he went to USC, took several months off after he was fired, then went to USC in kind of this consultant role. Um, 
And then he brought in Anthony Lynn as a run game coordinator to help him with that run game, help him with the mentality of that run game and to sit and talk to him about the things that he did differently. Like he goes, I knew I want to work with a young quarterback again. I got Jaden Daniels. So what did I do? I went out and got Marcus Mariota, even though he's on IR for us to sit in that quarterback room. Cause he was also a second overall pick and he had some good times and he had some pitfalls and to lend perspective to my young quarterback from a guy who's been there, who's done that, who's had the highs and disappointments as well. And so to lend that, you know, that voice to my young quarterback, that was important to me. Also, he said, you know, getting tight ends that can block, developing a run game, understanding the attitude of the attitude of a run game. And he goes, you know, from a rhythm standpoint, when you're a spread offense and you get out of rhythm, it's hard to just throw yourself back into rhythm. Now we can condense formations. We can get big. We can get physical. The other thing about using that spread formation is you open yourself up to all the exotic blitzes. So now I can condense, get into multiple tight end formations. When you watch them, man, they'll get into heavy formations a bunch. They'll even run about 20, 25 plays under center, which I'm a big fan of because it helps open up the play action. They do all this stuff now. So they look like where they didn't, you know, when he was previously with Arizona, they didn't look like an NFL offense. Now all of a sudden they're an NFL offense and they can do a bunch of multiple things. And ultimately, Jaden Daniels is – he, he looks like the real deal. I mean, that kid is a pleasure to talk to. He's smart. He's articulate. He spends time studying, man. He just works. He gets rep after rep after rep. And Cliff tells me, I go and meet with, with Cliff Kingsbury and the, and the Washington Commanders on Saturday morning. So I'm at their hotel Saturday morning. And Cliff comes in, sits down, and we start talking about the quarterback. And he goes, Dude, like the dude is the first guy in, last guy out. He goes, as a matter of fact, I was sitting in my office at the hotel, the makeshift, you know, offices that we have. He goes, I was sitting down there at 530 in the morning going through stuff. And who pops his head in at 530? My 23-year-old quarterback or whatever he is, 24-year-old, whatever, however old he is. He goes, pops his head in at 530. What are you working on? And he's just like, he is a football junkie that way. And the kid just works. Um, he's awesome. And offensively, man, they got Terry McLaurin is a great wide receiver. Like, I'll tell you a Terry McLaurin story. Like, John Gannon told me, hey, listen, when I coached for – I was not as a defensive coordinator for, um, for the Philadelphia Eagles, there wasn't a guy that we were afraid to go one-on-one -on -one with. Like, we would turn our cornerbacks loose one-on-one, -on -one, you know, whether it was Slay or, or I think it was Bradbury on the other side, one-on-one -on -one with this guy, one-on-one -on -one with this guy, no problem at all, follow him all over the football field. We did it all the time. And I'm talking every receiver in the league except one, Terry McLaurin. Hmm. Because that guy tore us up, and we always had a double team plan. He can flat run, he can get over the top. He's an unbelievable route runner. He just never had a quarterback, so he's like he is the one dude that like can beat you flat out, beat you, and you can't handle him in man to man. Like, and I was I, I knew Terry was good, but yeah. I didn't know he had that level of respect from other coaches. So. Um, they're doing it. They're running the snot out of the ball. Their quarterback is playing great football right now. I tell you what, it's a lot of fun to watch Washington. So have you seen enough through the first four weeks of the season to change your NFC East hierarchy at all? Your predicted order of finish? Yeah, I think that uh, I think that Washington has got some staying power. Now, I still think, like I said, I still think they've got some talent issues defensively. But here's the great thing. They know that. Right. They know they got problems on that side of the ball. Um, but, you know, they do feel like they'll get better. They do feel like, you know, if Forbes can start playing well, the, the guy who was a rookie last year, gaining some confidence in his ability to play, they've got some issues at the cornerback position. There's no question. But they're mixing and matching. They're figuring those things out. And as long as they continue to produce offensively, like they're producing, Mike, um, then all of a sudden you're like, well, we can overcome some of those defensive deficiencies because if we can score like we're scoring, we're going to make teams one dimensional. And then that fits, you know, that, that, that lends itself to us, you know, 
solving some of those issues on the defensive side of the ball. So, yeah, I do think I do think they have some staying power, and I do think that they're going to be competitive up to the end. Um, you know, with Philadelphia, with Dallas, um, and Dallas, you know, they've got injuries right now. I mean, the Dallas Cowboys have injuries. Yep. Marcus Lawrence has a Liz Frank. That thing is, it says eight weeks. He may be done for the season with that injury. That's a tough one. Um, and then the high ankle sprain with uh, with uh, Michael Parsons. Yep. Like, that's a defense that already struggled. Now, all of a sudden, you take two of their best players, the defensive players, out of the lineup. I mean, that's, that's going to be another issue there in Dallas. Well, speaking of issues, Kansas City has a big one now with Rasheed, Rasheed uh, Rice out after uh, – I don't know. Were you getting shades of uh, – uh, Bronco fans are going to have a terrible memory about this, but remember the great Terrell Davis was yeah. facing down the field after a, a, a an interception from Brian Greasy, and he's hustling back, and he gets taken out by an offensive lineman of yours – ends up shredding his knee and was never the same again. And here's Rasheed Rice running back and Patrick Mahomes is trying to make a tackle. He takes out his receiver. And yeah. and what does this mean for Kansas City now? Yeah, it's not it's not good. You're right. That offensive lineman, Matt Lepsis. Sorry, Matt. Um, yeah, sorry, Matt. But... Sorry, Matt. You ruined Terrell's career. <laughs> yeah. <hope> you're happy. <laughs> yeah. Statute of limitations. Statute of limitations don't run out on that one, Matt. Sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. No, Matt's a great guy. Unfortunate, you know, hustle. He was hustling, trying to make a, you know, make a tackle on interception. And, you know, pile just rolled into TD and the rest is history. Very much like Rasheed Rice. But you look at them now. It's Rasheed Rice. It looks like Hollywood Brown may be out for the season. The guy they signed in the offseason to take kind of that that role as that receiver or that number two receiver. Uh, they, the Isaiah Pacheco, who knows when he'll be back. Right. Um, Travis Kelsey has not produced like he normally does, although I think Travis Kelsey will be fine. Um, but, you know, even, even in that, Xavier Worthy, their first-round pick, who exploded on the scene week one. He had the reverse for the touchdown. Then he had the busted coverage that he beat down the sideline for a touchdown. And then he kind of went in the witness relocation program for a couple right. of weeks. And then he was back last week scoring a touchdown. Like, the, the thing I, I hate or I fear or, you know, I, I mean, I have respect for, but that bothers me as a Broncos fan is Kansas City will find a way through it. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't be surprised if their general manager, if Veach, I think, if their general manager finds a trade partner out there or finds a – or even in today's NFL, it's a little different. There are guys – on a practice squad that have legit big time yep. NFL experience that just happen to be older and you're grooming some younger players like Tim Patrick for the Detroit lions has been on the practice squad. He's been elevated now three weeks in a row, I think off the practice squad. Yep. So now he's got to go to the active roster, but Tim Patrick is a football player who happened to be injured for a couple of years, now getting a role in Detroit. And we saw what they did on Monday night to Seattle. I mean, mm-hmm. offensively, how about Jared Goff, 18 for 18? And I'm not talking about dinking and dunking. I'm talking about shoving the ball down the football field, hitting the deep dagger in cuts, and being just like, yeah, with the football. And 292 yards, three total touchdowns, two throwing, one he caught on uh, kind of the Philly special play, if you will. But um, I'm telling you what, like there are guys out there on practice squads that you can just go get. Mm-hmm. You just go get, add to your active roster, boom. It's not that the problem is solved, but at least you get a guy with veteran experience that will come in there and can actually play. So we'll see exactly how that works out. But certainly there's a concern with all the injuries that uh, the Kansas City Chiefs have. And let's not forget that I know he's Patrick Mahomes and I know he's kind of the new goat, um, but he's he's hasn't played like he he's, it's been his worst start to a season in the history of his career. So, you know, for all of us who root against the Kansas City Chiefs, we can just hope that that continues. <laughs> yes, right. Right. Uh, further proof that not all 0-2 starts are the same. Like some teams fall into that 0-2 start. You immediately start getting the stats yeah. about the difficulty of starting 0-2 and still making the playoffs. But I think the Baltimore Ravens have quickly recovered in such a way that doesn't really seem surprising, does it? Was this almost kind of predictable that they would rebound and rebound quickly? They they look like a beast again. 
Yeah, you know what? It was it was interesting. You know the the charade of hey, we're going to be a drop back team like that that lasted for two weeks, and you were zero and two, and you're like, hmm, maybe we should. I don't know, lean into our strengths, right? We went out and got Derrick Henry and we're giving him the ball 15 right. times a game. Maybe that's not the wisest decision. Let's ramp that up to about 25 carries a game. Let's go out and bludgeon people. Let's use our quarterback doing what really what he's the most gifted yeah. in the league to do. And that's to take off and run the ball, some design QB runs, all the things they're doing right now. And they took a 3-0 and team in the Buffalo Bills and bludgeoned them. That was a good old-fashioned curb stomp. And um, I'm, I'm telling you, man, unbelievable physical ass whooping. They've done it two weeks in a row to the Dallas Cowboys. Came back with some garbage late touchdowns at the end of that game in Dallas. But they kept the foot on the gas last weekend against the Baltimore – or the Baltimore Ravens did against the Buffalo Bills and – um, and they were phenomenal. I'll tell you what, I'll take you back to the Dallas game two weeks ago, man. One thing you can always tell how a team feels about you as a football team based on the way they, they game plan you. And, man, I, I went through every one of Dak Prescott's incompletions the week before against Dallas, and the amount of man coverage up yours, and we call it cat coverage, I got my cat. You take your cat, right? <laughs> and they just lined up and said, you don't scare us. We are that good. And I'm telling you what, physically, when you can line up and you can do that and you go, we ain't, we ain't nervous. Like, this is what we're going to do. And to watch them do that and to carry that through to Buffalo as well, um, they're a big physical team that's playing complimentary football and they realize now all we got to do is get Derrick Henry going. Like they're not the greatest athletic team you know, when it comes to pass protection and all that stuff, but they will bludgeon you. They got a 330 pound fullback. They used to be a defensive lineman in Patrick Ricard who just absolutely destroys people. So like what they're doing right now, that's the way they're built. And for all the, you know, Lamar is going to take it to the next level and be the greatest player ever, and he's going to pass his way into stop, stop mm -hmm. it, stop. Oh, we need a number one receiver. We've never had a number one receiver. Who gives a shit? You've got the best, like, the best running quarterback and the big – like, I stood next to Derrick Henry last year at practice. I was doing a Tennessee game. He's he's taller than I am. I'm six. Like I used to be six three. I'm I'm probably six two. And like I had a bunch of discs in my back removed, yeah, so they went crap. like this, like digits. <laughs> so I'm I'm probably more like six two now. But uh, Derrick Henry was every bit of six three, maybe a little a shade above that, and every bit of two fifty. Mm -hmm. And you saw that first eighty seven yard run. He ran away at two fifty six three two fifty two fifty five maybe. He ran away from DBs that, that you know, are 4140 guys that are 190 pounds. Just like, see ya, whoo, like, that's not fair. He is not of, he's not, like, he's not of this planet. He's not a human. <laughs> he's just not. Well, it's uh, another, you know, great weekend coming up. We actually have some teams now going on buys. Bye weeks have shown up all of a sudden. Right. So we'll uh, have some games to preview a little bit later on in the week. Still some other great stories. we got to talk about the the Vikings and the Texans and uh, some of those other teams that are off to really good starts. Some surprising disappointments. Miami, what's happened to your guy, Coach Capri Pants? Uh, I mean, I get right. he doesn't have Tua, but come on. I, th I, I, th I thought he was going to rewrite the way that uh, offensive football was I know. Was I, know. I, thought it right. was, I thought it was all about hiring a genius like, right uh, again you know genius and football mutually exclusive events yes remember i strapped a thin piece of plastic on my head for right. 12 years and slammed my head into other men wearing a thin piece of plastic like it, it genius it, mutually exclusive my vision of how football was created was a couple of guys after a night of drinking with crayons wrote on the back of a pit, uh, like a pizza box. Like, Hey, let's let, like, right. let's design a game. This is, that's football PE majors 
It's a, it's a game that is coached by PE majors and played by PE mm-hmm. majors. Genius and, and football mutually exclusive. They, they don't exist together. Yeah. So we'll, uh, we'll put Mike McDaniel under the microscope as well a little later on this week. Right. Plus his choice in pants. I mean, how can you call anybody a genius that will wear pedal pushers? Not so fast. <laughs> hey, for everybody involved in the Sting Truth podcast, uh, he is Mike Evans. I am Mark Schler. Thank you so much for making us a part of your day. We truly appreciate you guys. And, uh, uh, we'll be back with you uh, later on this week. Have a great one.